Okay. <clears throat> I can hear you, Jay. Good job. Okay, anytime. Okay, my name is, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Richard Larn. I'm the program director for the Arizona Photography Alliance. Today we have uh, a kind of a double header. Uh, Richard Jackson and Matt Beatty uh, are joining us, are gonna be the presenters. Yes, um, a, a little while ago, I mean, all during this time when we've been virtual, I've been thinking about visiting places that would normally be very difficult to get to. Um, and, you know, Flagstaff is not too difficult to get to, but it would involve a, a kind of a road trip. So it's nice to be able to reach out to people in Tucson as we did, people in Ajo as we did, and now in Flagstaff. And uh, when you start asking around in Flagstaff, you start hearing Richard and Matt's name quite a bit. So I thought, well, let's put together something involving those two. Um, Richard Jackson has uh, started his own business some time ago. I can't remember exactly when, called Hans Partners. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be responding to these, these uh, slides, let me do that. Um, so this is uh, a little bit about our, our mission and a photograph by Barbara Garber on the right hand side uh, there. Um, you can read what we do. We have events on a more or less monthly basis. There's Mike Lundgren on the upper left. Uh, there's a uh, editing workshop on the lower left with Joan Lifton. Uh, that's a members exhibit on the lower right. And that is, uh, help me out. Um, uh, Jeremy. I, I, Jeremy Rowe, of course, uh, talking about photographs and collecting. Um, and so that's a, kind of the breadth of what we do. We do, in the case, the upper right, upper left, it was book signings. And so we do a lot of different kinds of events. Up next, is um, a studio visit with one of my favorite people in the world, Marie Navarre, who's been represented by Lisa Setti for decades, literally. Um, and Marie, as you'll, as you'll see, is, is a very sweet and uh, you know, is just a great person, a really one of my favorite artists. And this is gonna be a somewhat interesting hybrid event. So we're gonna get like eight or 10 people visiting Marie's studio. It's not large. Um, that's one reason not to have a, a whole crowd of people. But also we're, we're gonna get people who are vaccinated times two plus two weeks. And the idea we have is to kind of have eight or 10 people in the, in the studio and then also broadcast it um, as a Zoom call. So we'll see how that works, but it's a glimmer of hope at the, you know, that we can actually look at light reflected off an art object rather than uh, a screen uh, in the future. And we also have coming up our third annual members meeting and exhibit. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, we've recently come to the conclusion we could probably do it in person, but we're sort of late to the game in terms of the, the venues. And so we're trying to work something out. It might be virtual. It'll probably be, there'll probably be an in-person component, but um, we are uh, improvising that as we go. Um, so, uh, Next slide, Fred. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for being a member and welcome to our guests. Um, and this is uh, some hashtags and um, whatnot for, for us as well as um, for Hidden Light, it looks like uh, there. And so we have two people we're gonna hear from today, Richard Jackson, uh, who started Hans Partners, and Matt Beatty, who's the current owner of Hidden Light. And there's a, there's a kind of continuity between the two companies in that when Richard started Hans Partners, um, he moved out of the building that Matt is now occupying. And in the interim, two of Richard's employees started Hidden Light, uh, and it now uh, is owned by Matt. So there's a real continuum there and a connection between the two gentlemen we're gonna hear from today. Um, and I think, I think that I'll just hand it over to uh, Richard right now. And then what we're gonna do, the structure of the event is we're gonna to listen to Richard. Then we're gonna go get a tour of Matt's uh, business hidden light. And then we're gonna do a question and answer afterwards. So if you have a question for Richard, let's hold it until um, after Matt's uh, talk. And I also would like to encourage you to 
uh, mute yourself because if your cat jumps up in front of the computer, then the camera goes right to that. Um, and uh, so if you could, everybody could mute themselves except for Richard and Matt, that'd be great. Okay, now without further ado, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to Richard Jackson. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. And thank you everyone for inviting me and um, also Matt for this presentation today. Um, Hans Partners is a company my wife and I started in 1990. I've, I've been a printer longer than that, but this particular company we started in 1990 and there is no Mr. Hans involved. Um, the name is because we met and had at the top of Hans Rapids in Grand Canyon many, many years ago. That's the name, that's another very long story we don't have time for today, but um, that's the reason for the name. But Hans Partners has always focused on making prints for photographers who sell their work in galleries or are doing a museum exhibit or we do have done commercial uh, exhibit as well as um, com by, by commercial medium and corporate installations of photography prints. And also um, we make prints for photographers who are working uh, to make prints for a collector. Now, I no longer have the large 6,000 square foot building with lots of equipment and people. I, I, um, I decided that if I was ever gonna get to do other things in my life, I'm gonna have to not be there every day. And the only way I could actually make prints is to be there every day. I'm a real hands-on guy. And even though I only had uh, eight or 10 people working for me at the most, I was always in the lab, always on top of what everything was in terms of quality. Because what I know about printing for photographers is that they already know what the print is supposed to look like before I ever walk in the dark room or ever go into the lab. And it's just my job. My job is to find out and get in their head as to what that vision is and how that has to appear on a piece of paper so that the only, in, the only two possibilities at the end of the process is they say, that's exactly what I was expecting or that's better than I had hoped for. If we haven't got one of those two answers, we're just not done. And so I've been lucky to be able to have printed for a number of really great photographers around the country and around the world. Um, you know, probably a lot of them, Jack Dykinga, Jay Dussard, who is on this meeting today, and I have worked together on a number of his projects. Um, Tom Mangelson, Franz Lanting, George Steinmetz, Steve McCurry, um, Stephen Wilkes, some of these names you may have heard of, but I've been really, really uh, honored to be able to make prints for these photographers, photographers for many, many years. Uh, now what I do when people ask me if I've retired, I say, no, I just work on projects of interest, which is true because right now all I have for a production piece of equipment is a Canon printer in my, my office at home but I still work on projects that could include working towards a gallery exhibit or a museum exhibit or a corporate installation. And the way I do that is working with photographers either I know or who have found me and we work through making match prints and it's usually one-on-one. -on -one. I'm either going to them or they're coming to me. And we work on these one-on-one -on -one until we get to a place where the photographer is happy with the work and then we, if it, requires prints larger than what I produce. We go to a trusted output lab that can match, use our master files and match the match prints that we have produced. And then the exhibit is produced from those match prints and enlargements. So that's typically what I do, but what I wanted to talk to you today about, and, and I'm probably gonna say a lot of things you already know, I'm sure of that but maybe I'll say them in a different way that will make some connection that's a little different for you. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about is the print itself. Just think of what I think about when I think of a print is that the print in an exhibit, whether it's in a gallery or a museum or in collector's hands becomes the original. It's that vision which you have decided is what you want to present to the viewer. And 
having said that, there's a lot to think about when it comes to making prints and how that vision gets presented in such a way so the person seeing it sees it the way you want them to. And for me, that starts with understanding a little bit uh, and remembering maybe for everybody, because I know you guys are experienced photographer, photographers and printers, but just as a reminder that film and sensors are not prints. They are just like apples and oranges. They're just really different. Especially with today's digital sensors are capable of capturing as many as 14 stops. So wide scene brightness range capability. Film is really good at capturing a wide scene brightness range as well, whether it's black and white or color. But paper can't re reproduce all of that. It can do the best it can do with a photo black ink if it's inkjet or on a piece of photographic paper is probably about eight stops. And if you're using matte paper, you've got even less to work with. So it's always been my job is how to figure out how to get a big wide scene brightness range into a piece of reflective material that we're going to look at with light shining on it that gives us the same feeling as how you were thinking about this print, what it looked like on your monitor, what it looked like on the back of your camera, or what it looked like on a light table. How do you do that? Well, it, it's a process and it is something that I really love to do and work with photographers to achieve that, those subtle changes within the dynamic range of a piece of paper to give them the end results so that when lit properly, it gives them the feeling that they were looking for, it gives them the expectation they were hoping for. It presents to the viewer that idea or that scene as the viewer would expect to see it or, would, would, or the photographer wants the viewer to see it. So that's what I work on the most. And uh, that's a whole nother program. So hopefully we can do that someday as to how I go about dissecting an image and working with a photographer to present uh, on a piece of paper that, that they've seen either as a piece of film or on their uh, computer monitor. Um, but the thing I also wanna talk about is how we go through the process of of thinking about producing work for a particular exhibit, whether it's a museum exhibit or a game exhibit. And I like to think backwards in the process. I wanna know what the space is going to be like and what the lighting is gonna be like before we ever start thinking about making test prints. Because one of the biggest failures in presenting work in a gallery or in a, or a museum is not knowing what the space and the lighting is going to be like. And then once you've presented, made the work and put it up and the lighting doesn't work, it's, it's just a big letdown. Because the only way we get to see a reflective object is with light and it has to be the right kind of light, has to be the right amount of light relative to how the print was made. And if we start with how it's going to be presented and what space and what the lighting's like and work backwards, then we have a much better chance of achieving the result that you are trying to present to the viewer. So an example of this is an exhibit I printed for a photographer who's a geographic photographer by the name of Michael Nichols. He goes by Nick Nichols. Um, he had a 40 year retrospective of his work at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in, 2000, in June of 2017. And Nick and I worked together on his mass and his match prints at his studio in Virginia for uh, two sessions and took us over, over four weeks in total time to produce the match prints and master files. But before I ever went to see him, I went to the museum first. A year before the exhibit opened, I showed up in Philadelphia and walked the museum the spaces and discuss the lighting with the um, curator photography for that exhibit. And typically museum lighting relative to how you, you want your photo photograph to look is just awful. 
it you know they're used to doing you know five foot candles just because they want to preserve the artwork that's in being uh, exhibited but we both knew nick and i both knew that five foot candles wasn't going to make these prints feel like what they should what he expected them to look like and so we discussed this idea and the museum now not everybody will do this i, and I get this but then what the museum did was they bought two sets of prints they bought in a set for the exhibit and they bought a set for collection wow <laughs> and we had good lighting because that was really important i can share with you some pictures from that exhibit um, if i can figure out share screen so bear with me. I'm going to click share screen. And do I click desktop? I need a little technical help here. Fred, are you able to jump in? Yes. Um, I want to go to my could, desktop, Fred. So what you want to do is go to your desktop and open the file you want to show. OK. And then go to share, and you'll see some thumbnails of various files that are open. Click on the one you want. Okay. Um. Can everybody see that? I can see your finder there, uh, but not uh, the your picture. folder. But it's not, not open yet. Yeah. Double click on. Double click on the open. There you go. There you go. Okay. That works. Yep. So this is the this is the front steps of the Muse of Philadelphia Museum of Art. And in addition to making prints for the gallery, we made these really huge banners of some of Nick's images. This one of the of the owl flying through these columns, uh, then mm. with strips of a really large banner material that was printed. Um, I'm not sure where they printed that, but we, we did produce the file for it. And then, um, how do I get to the next slide? We'll need to open the uh, next slide. I think, Richard, if you wanted to select all those files that you wanted to show in that folder and open them all together, that would allow you to click from one to the other in okay. preview. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Is that, can you see that? Yes, we're seeing that. The same image as before, yeah. Okay, then um, another image we did was, uh, one of the other banners we did was, um, things are happening here, I'm not able to, <laughs> I apologize for my uh, lack of ability with this uh, software. What I would what I would do, Richard, is uh, select all the files in that folder that you want to show, and then just um, Command O for open all those files. Um, that okay. should bring them all into preview. There you go. That that's it. And then use your arrow keys going to go up and down. Yeah, I'm using them, but it's not uh, something is not quite uh, oh, well. correct yet. But bear with me. OK, 
Okay, I have them selected. So just okay. Now double open. click, double click on that. On the image, or just do Command Open. I think Command Open. Yeah. Like they got two open here. So this is the inside uh, of the. We're not seeing another. them quite right now. We're still seeing your your uh, folders, um, not not preview. Well, let me let me instead of um, going through this, um, I'm, I apologize for my not work. It's not working correctly, but that's that's on me, not you. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, just to back up. Uh, what I did was, I, again, I walked through the exhibit space with um, the exhibit uh, director and curator the year before, and we discussed the lighting and we, we, we did present two, print two sets of prints so that the lighting could be acceptable and, and in terms of how the prints would look relative to what, how Nick wanted them to look um, for the exhibit. And so just to read this, just to uh, discuss again, what I wanted to say, the important part is to understand the exhibit space and how your prints are gonna be lit because if they're lit improperly, then it kind of falls on its face. The uh, images, because it's a reflective object, it, the amount of light that's striking the image is gonna determine how your image is gonna look. And so, um, the important part I think is to start there and then go back to when you are working with your images, um, having similar lighting in your space where you're printing so that now that you, you can see your prints, how they will look in the final exhibit. Um, and without that c continuity of, of a presentation, there's a large possibility that what you're working on, if you don't know how it's gonna be presented, won't meet your satisfaction, won't meet what you intended. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. And I don't know if you wanna move over to Matt at this point. Okay, we could do that, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I can do a little segue here. Um, our second presenter is, is, is Matt Beatty, uh, owner of Hidden Light. And the next time I'm heading up to Flagstaff, I'm gonna stop in and see Matt. Um, he seems to have a really interesting uh, business going. And again, part of a continuity between Richard Jackson and, and, and through his employees, the founders of Hidden Light into, the, into Matt. So it's kind of a, a straight through line um, and um, yeah, as the weather heats up here, we're all looking forward to getting up there to Flagstaff <laughs> and, and paying, paying you a visit. But why don't you take it away, Matt? Sweet. Well, hi guys, my name is Matt and um, I own Hidden Light. We're kind of a niche um, print lab where we do things the old school way a little bit. Some of you might be familiar with old school, like words like dark room instead of light room. Uh, that's kind of our shtick. So uh, we process uh, film up to 20 by 24 sheet film. We make prints, silver gelatin, platinum palladium, a little bit of inkjet, as well as some of the alt process stuff like cyanotype, Van Dyke, salt print, calotype, blah, ambrotype, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's generally speaking the old school way of doing things. And recently, um, we opened up a gallery and we invited a few photographers um, to put in some work. And so that's where I'm sitting right now in this gallery with these ridiculous, um, massive prints. Um, everything made by hand, about half are silver gelatin and the other half are platinum palladium. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of give you guys a little tour of the space here. Uh, it's quite small, so it won't take very long. And then I'll give you a little tour of our print lab and talk a little bit about uh, what we do over there. And then we can kind of sit down and have some Q's and some A's. Um, so I'm gonna flip my camera here if I'm smart enough to do this. There we go. Um, so 
we'll just do a little little gallery tour here. So as you walk in the door here, and we're just going to kind of wander through a selection of prints. Uh, hopefully this uh, is reasonably large on your screen. Doesn't look very good in gallery view, which I'm in right now. Uh, but this it, is a stack looks, of my work. Looks really good, and, man. Yeah. Good. Yeah. If yeah. you have to forgive my. Uh, iPad screen, it's not doing them very much justice, but we can pretend, right? So these are all platinum prints. Uh, we make platinum prints up to 44 by 96 inches, which are some of the largest in the world. Um, and certainly the largest that you can um, have someone else make for you. Uh, commercial platinum labs are uh, pretty difficult to come by. There are about five or six of us in the world. Um, Richard's point about light, uh, is something we take very seriously here. All of these images were proofed in proper gallery light. Um, these are actually gold platinum. So they're platinum prints um, that have gold leaf on the back of the print shining through it. So that's why they look extremely super crazy warm. So you're actually seeing 23 karat gold shine through the paper, which is kind of fun. That's a rare process. <laughs> um, these are by a photographer out of Hollywood called Tyler Shields. He's got a <clears throat> very interesting, very different fine art sort of aesthetic. Um, so those are all platinum. Here's a couple silvers. At any given time, he has five or six projects in the works. Here's one of his um, more recent releases. Again, that's Tyler Shields. Then I've got um, Angela Bramson out of New York. Obviously she doesn't shoot these there. <laughs> uh, but she spends, I would say probably three months out of any given year on Safari and puts together some really incredible images. And these are all platinum as well, 30 by 40s. And of course, when you come up here and actually look at these in person, they look a little better. And then we've got some Jerry Jackas over here. These were some of the last prints that we were able to make for Jerry before he passed, uh, all from his four by five negatives. Um, and many of these were also published in Arizona Highways as well. And I got another one of his in the corner here. So these are all silver gelatin. Uh, most of them are also selenium toned because silver gelatin wasn't hard enough. <laughs> and then we've got uh, a stack by a guy named Dick David Brookover. He's out of uh, Jackson Hole. Uh, all the prints, almost all the prints were made here by us. And then we also do framing. So uh, we framed everything ourselves. There's another Jerry Jacka. And another one. Can I a ask a more. question Go about yeah, your, jump in. Uh, the platinum? Is it, uh, are the negatives that big or you're actually uh, using an enlarger and exposing on uh, paper that's been treated with. Yeah, so the, the platinum process is a contact print process. So the negative has to be the same size as the finished print. This is a silver gelatin. So he shot this on whatever, eight by 10 or something. Um, and then we kind of, you know, optically enlarge it in an enlarger. This is a platinum, so that's whatever, a 16 by 20, and the negative is 16 by 20 and lays directly on the paper um, after it's been sensitized. And this is also on a handmade paper, Japanese paper, which is why it's got this crazy texture to it. One of the fun things about platinum is since there's no commercial papers, you just make your own papers, right? It can be anything you want. So uh, we can hand coat really thick, fun papers. We can hand coat really thin, uh, handmade Japanese papers, you know, the kind that are only made by one person. And then when they're gone, they're gone forever. 
So we do a little bit of everything. So that's the gallery. I'll just kind of wander us across here. It's a really long commute to my print lab. <laughs> So this is kind of the space. We have uh, used cameras and film equipment here. Got a couple of Dan Budnicks up on the wall, um, which is a really fun one. This is kind of like where our business really comes into play. So the story behind this image you might find interesting. So this is JFK's um, funeral, 1963. And Mr. Dan Budnick shot this as a panorama on his Leica. It's like four frames. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to stitch a panorama in the dark room before. Um, it's almost impossible, very difficult to do, especially with three or four frames in an enlarger. To try and pull that off would be very painful. So what we did is in 2007, 2008 maybe, something like that, we um, scanned the negatives, stitched them in Photoshop, and then we're able to produce a handmade silver gelatin print. And there's, you can't tell at all that it's stitched together. There's one column that doesn't sit upright quite, but everything else is, uh, is pretty much perfect. So that's kind of a fun one. So anyway, picture framing. Uh, looks like a picture framing shop. You, you know, sort of expect to look, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll kind of run through some darkroom stuff. So here are some prints in progress we've had um, floating around. So we still do everything proof. And then we bring the photographer in and they'll tell us, you know, give me a little burn here. Give me a little burn here. Let's hold some of this. Um, we'd still, you know, proof, print, proof, print, proof, print. And like Richard was saying, we're doing it um, with very controlled lighting. So I've got the door open behind me. So you, the lighting's not as good as it could be, but these lights are the same lights that we have in our gallery and the same lights that a lot of the galleries that we work with use. So I know that when I make this print and it goes to the gallery, wherever it's gonna go, it's gonna look the same in their light as it does in ours. This is my cave. And this is kind of what it looks like when we're in a print in progress mode. Um, so this is a negative that's gonna be making a silver gelatin print. Uh, this one is 24 by 44. And um, because <laughs> the photographer's negative either was ruined or he doesn't want us to hold on to it or whatever else, he scans it and we print ourselves a negative, take that into the enlarger um, and just place it in contact with the paper. So I've got one of those prints sitting around down here. Ugh. Not that one. It looks like that when it's finished. Um, and they're we, we did a blind, we've done this blind taste test with photographers a few times. We'll do an optical enlargement from one image and then we'll do a digital enlargement with a, with a contact print. And I've yet to find a photographer aside from Richard Jackson who can tell the difference. <laughs> and Richard Jackson has had been doing this uh, so long that it's got enough fair that he knows. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you would expect him to know, right? Um, I was talking briefly about how we make some of the biggest platinums you can buy. This entire table is actually a UV light table. Wow. So uh, I'll just flip on the uh, bottom here. If you look underneath it, I've got 10 feet worth of UV bulbs here um, on a custom sheet of glass that allows us to expose a really big piece of paper to UV light, which is what platinum palladium is sensitive to. It's, it's a UV based process. Um, so that's kind of, the fun there. And then we also have a proper silver gelatin darkroom. All the way in the back of the building. Um, our silver prints we can do to about 30 by 50. Any bigger in the paper just gets too painful to handle. Um, but we've got a series of four by five enlargers. We've got the big 10 by 10 over there in the corner. Um, and we can do it from either your negatives or from any digital file. I had a lady come in this week and she wanted silver gelatins from her iPhone photos. No problem. We're happy to do that. Just uh, print out a little baby negative and make a baby little print. Or you can do the crazy big ones like that negative we saw on the other table. Um, and then of course, big vacuum press to flatten everything. Here's uh, 
another big silver print. This is by a photographer here in Flagstaff, Shane Knight. Um, this one's waiting to be mounted. But that's uh, a 40 something, maybe 50 inch print there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the tour. Um, the whole point here is, you know, we're executing your vision and we're doing it in a way that's going to last maybe not forever, but a really long time. <laughs> hey, Matt, can you, can you talk about that case of cameras too? Flip this back around here. Um, so it's film photography gear. Everything is used. Um, we call it an, our adopt a camera program. Um, because you know all of these these beautiful cameras need new homes. I've been fostering them for a while, and uh, I can't keep them all. Um, so it goes pretty quick, honestly. There's a, a pretty big revival in in film gear that's happening right now. For those of you that um, you know aren't shooting film, if you've got a closet full of film cameras, they're not worth what you paid for them. Um, which is great. So we've got you know big proper kits like this RB kit up here. And we've got these, you know, cute little eighties and nineties point and shoots and everything in between. So we buy stuff, check it out, play with it and then sell it. And we also sell and develop film. We lost a little bandwidth or a little, we're buffering on Matt. Internet's terrible here. Well, I, I think we got, we got most of it. <laughs> um, uh, Richard, yeah. Richard, I have a comment about what Matt's doing. Yeah, go ahead. It's really, really hard work. As everybody who's been in the dark room knows to make that perfect print and all of his clients, as all of my clients were always the same. If it isn't perfect, it's just not gonna work. And he's working with large pieces of film and making contact prints and doing the kinds of things that you have to be really good at what you do to, to come out with a perfect print. And it's really hard work. So good for Matt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can. I, 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 I remember <laughs> those days, although I wasn't I'm working. Sure. Uh, Everybody has those 50. memories yeah. of not of, of you look at it really close and it looks really good, and then there's one little thing that you have to go back and do it again. Yeah, yeah. I remember keeping track, of, of keeping track of the minutes and the hours would get away from me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. Well, I think let's let's open it up to uh, question and answer. So I'll remind everybody that they're muted or should have been. Um, but you'll un have to unmute yourself. And I'm not going to really moderate the question and answer. We'll just kind of try and take turns if anybody has a question for either Richard or Matt. Can I start? Yeah. I'll ask Richard and Keith a question, they, two separate questions. I've noticed, I've been to uh, galleries where you have the pure white, white walls. I've been to galleries where they've had the, the dark gray walls. and it always seems to have an effect on how you see that image for Richard. And then for Keith, have you ever had anything to do with the Palladio company that produced the machine-coated platinum prints? So in, um, in answering about the color and the, of the walls and galleries, those are typically, many times the color of the walls can change with the exhibit. And one of the questions I would have if I'm talking to a gallery owner about an upcoming exhibit for a, for, a, for a show I'm printing for a photographer, and I would do this in collaboration with a photographer, of course, I would ask them, well, what color are the walls going to be? Because many times they get changed. At least one wall gets changed, if not more than one. And so that becomes important as well, because if you're going to you know, there needs to be some agreement between the gallery and the photographer as to what color the wall is going to be, whether if it's going to be a neutral color, does it need to be light, medium or dark? Because how you see the print is going to change under those conditions. So yeah, you're right. Something to consider in that process of thinking backwards, for sure. 
And then, and then for Matt, have you ever had any experience with, I remember the 90s using the Palladio company that had machine coded platinum palladium papers that were just absolutely- Oh, uh, the good old platinum. days when you could just buy a box of paper, you know, and use it. Uh, to my knowledge, you can't buy commercially coded platinum paper anymore. No. Um, and, but man, God, that would make it so much easier. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, what we do uh, allow people to do or we recommend they do is kind of tell us what feel, what level of warmth, what level of contrast they're looking for in their platinum prints. And then we tailor the chemistry mix of the emulsion to suit that. I've got some guys who want them crazy warm, like as close to sepia as you can get. And I've got people who want them neutral and high contrast. So, you know, we start the conversation with a conversation rather than me looking at your images. We talk about what kind of feel you want, you know, how you want them to go together. Are we matching something existing, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and then we'll, we'll build the emulsion to suit. Yeah, I think as most people talk platinum, when actually the print they're making is a platinum palladium. Yeah, although recently more people have been interested in pure platinum because it's so much cheaper than palladium Yeah, because the price has just skyrocketed yeah. in the last few years. Um, I still do a, a mix pretty much all the time. All right, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I would have a question and this is for Matt. Um, in your experience, do you have experience, I guess, uh, with Leica and negatives that are shot on a Leica? And uh, second part of that question, when someone wants a blow up from a 35 millimeter negative, uh, is there advantage to having it shot by a Leica? I've worked with images from various film like us obviously and I've worked with uh, files from the M10 and its family um, and really honestly the sensors as far as I'm concerned are close enough to the same that it doesn't really matter the glass becomes the problem yeah if you are using good glass um, and you focus correctly and you're stopped down far enough that what you're doing is actually in focus you'll be fine mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you're you got smudges on your glass or you haven't cleaned your filter or whatever, you're going to run into problems. But honestly, uh, the Leica, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be the same as the everything else that has decent glass. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank uh, you. I wanted to say that uh, Matt gave us, Alan and myself, a nice tour of this facility about 10 days ago. Uh -huh. And I want to encourage people to come up and visit because it's a, a very unique spot to have that facility. It's very neat. And uh, it's uh, you, you know one of a kind, I, th I think, in Arizona. So uh, think and about it. It's well hidden, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the building <laughs> looks like a church. Yeah. And well, yeah, there's not absolutely. a lot telling you that it's not. It's a beautiful building, too. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at the building. <laughs> uh, one question, you know, uh, I remember one of the neat things about silver printing is doing spotting. And now you have these gigantic prints. Tell us about spotting, how you handle all the imperfections. We still spot silver prints the same way that silver prints have been spotted for a zillion years. Uh, and we spot platinum prints essentially the same way, but instead of using spot tone, we're using watercolor. Um, that allows me to match the tone of whatever the emulsion ended up looking like when it's finished. Um, but they all require spotting. They're handmade prints. They all have <clears throat> what I like to call character. And a spotting is necessary and, and sort of like kind of a tell in, in many ways that it's a handmade print. And it was, you know, like, yeah, there's some stuff in it. If you, if you had a bunch of dead bugs in your film holder when you shot the negative and you're not going to let me Photoshop them out, you're going to get a bunch of dead bugs in your print. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we don't see that very often. <laughs> well, I have, I have a question for Richard uh, to kind of go back to the light um, that's used in various venues. Um, I guess the variables are the, uh, the sort of quantity of light, but also the color of light. And maybe the, you know, whether the light's coming from an LED or an incandescent bulb, I, I don't know. Um, could you talk about how you 
measure the light and how you understand it and what I should know as a photographer about the light? The, one of the more important things to remember about light is that all light is not equal, obviously. I know you all know that, but um, <clears throat> color rendering index is a really important key to having lighting that works well with your images, especially if you're printing color. Um, a lot of the newer LED lighting fixtures that are being used in galleries these days, not all galleries, but that's everything is shifting that way. You want to make sure that the, the lamps they've chosen, the lights they've chosen, have a high color, render, color rendering index, at least above 90. Because if it's less than 90, the colors that in your, are in your prints will not present the way you saw them under the lighting that you printed them under or approve them under. They just won't. Uh, the light doesn't have the same spectrum of um, that, that uh, higher color render, rendering index number uh, lamp does. So always above 90, especially any lighting that you use for color correcting your prints, um, whether it be fluorescent tubes at 5,000 K, those also come in a high CRA, CRI index lamp. Uh, and again, always above 90. Um, but the amount of light is also critical. And so it's hard to qualify, say you need this much light for this print because it's gonna vary somewhat depending on the, how big the space is and, and how far away the light is from the image. But um, the amount of light that strikes the print has everything to do with how you see the print because it's a reflective object. Uh, the light has to pass through all of the layers of the image, whether it's a dye layer, if it's a C print or a cibachrome print, or it's a, it's a inkjet layer, it has to reach the white base of the print and then reflect back through those to your eyes. So, Light has to do double duty on prints. So it has to, so lighting, the amount of lighting and the color quality of the lighting is incredibly critical. Okay, I, I, just to follow up, um, I'm, kind, I'm familiar with Kelvin and I'm familiar with how to measure maybe the quantity of light, but uh, the color rendering index, I don't, I don't quite understand that. Um, the color rendering index is really, um, one way, to, one way to compare it is a color rendering index of incandescent lamps is, all, is always 100, 100, and that's the highest value. It may be a warm light, but it does have a high color rendering, rendering index. If you compare that to say a fluorescent light fixture you go by at Homeco, even if it says it's a daylight or it's 5,000 degrees Kelvin, it may not have a high color rend rendering index. And if you would take a print that you've made and put it under two different, say two different 5,000 Kelvin light sources, one has a high color re rendering index and the other one is less than 90, you will see that the print has, will look completely different in terms of color. Okay. So, so it's the, it renders the amount, so the spectral sensitivity of the dyes that are reacting to the light source. So if there's a low red value, a low red component in the lamp that has a low color rendering, rendering index, all the reds will look dead. Mm. So okay. the highest color rendering index you can have in a lamp, the better off you are. 100 is the best, but not many other than incandescent lamps have 100 as a CRI, but you can get as high as 95 now in some lamps, okay. LEDs. Okay. Richard, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, oh. following up on that, is there a way to, or how do you tell the color uh, rendering index other than what the product manufacturers uh, claims? I, well, typically I have to trust that. There is, there is a little, there are some tests um, that you can get. I don't have one currently, but there's a, a little device that has um, color, a color swatch. And if the color rendering index is, is too far off, the color swatch will break apart and part of it will be one color and part of it will be another color. Mm -hmm. I'll have to get do some research and maybe I can 
get that information to Richard or, mm -hmm. or to you. Um, and that way you can pass that on to your members. But um, I usually use um, graphic technologies. There are uh, GTI um, lamps out of um, New Jersey. And they, all they do is, is uh, high quality lighting for uh, reproduction of um, either printing companies or, or phot photography companies, uh, photographers. So um, they make typically a fluorescent lamp, although they're just about to release an <laughs> LED fixture that an LED lamp that also fits in a fluorescent tube that's also very high color rendering index, 5,000 degree Kelvin. So I, I just trust the company that claims they do all the research and, yeah. mm -hmm. and then the, the best way to test it is to put a print under that light and then take it to a window with indirect light and compare to see if it still looks the same because mm -hmm. the sun has a color, re color rendering index of 100 also got kind of measuring against okay. that. Mm. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Um, I haven't printed for many years, but uh, uh, I wanted to, to print just so that I can have some prints made that will last longer than a hard drive. And my question is, is there a basic way to, to start out with this to uh, get the right Kelvin and uh, the right amount of light on a print? To justify, to, 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 uh, to look at it when you're making it? Well, there's. Um, you have no specific goal other than to put them in a box for prosperity. prosperity. Um, I typically use, well, what I use in, in my setup at, at, in my office is a. Um, I have 5,000 degree Kelvin high CRE, CRI lamps, which produce a light level similar. Well, there are two 40 watt fixtures that are four feet from the wall. And I also have two 75 watt um, 2800 degree Kelvin lamps to look at the same image under gallery lighting should I need to do that. Or I can look at them under a mixed light source if I want to do that. So a combination of daylight or um, a warmer light source. But the amount of the light is similar to if you walk next to a window and it's sunny outside, but there's but you don't have direct light on your picture. If it looks good there, it's going to look good just pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. If the lighting is if the lighting is sufficient, a, a very low light situation like in a museum with five foot candles, it won't look that good. But typically for someone to see the print in a way that is representative of how it should feel, the easiest way to do is walk to a window with indirect lighting and just during the day, during the daylight hours and just look at it there. To follow up on that, uh, you mentioned a separate set of prints for the museum for their collection. Is that how you would have made those prints? We made them this exactly the same way we made the display set. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. okay. oh, okay. We didn't make them for the five foot candle. We just, they needed to have a copy for the collections and they were willing to take them exactly the same as we presented them. And how, how would you uh, make a print for a photographer that wanted to, to sell the print to a collector? What's your standard for that? Well, it would be, I, would, I always look at it under a mixture of light and feel if it feels good under 5,000 and it feels good under incandescent, then, and then I also, I do also walk to that window and I kind of take a look there too, because okay. people are going to look at it under, you cannot always control the lighting, right. although it's a nice thing to be able to say you can do that, you can't. Um, so you want it to have a, you want it to feel really um to be a, a, a well lit print under reasonable lighting, it's, it's never going to look great under someone who puts their print up in a very dark hallway or a room without sufficient lighting, and you really can't control that. 
and I wouldn't try and print for that. Mm -hmm. um, I would try and print for reasonable light levels so that the print looks good under a reasonable light level. And what I mean by that is that walk to the window is a good, good way to kind of do a gut check as to if you're, if you're about there or not. Does that include Chicago light? <laughs> well, um, it, you know, you're probably it can be great a little bit. You might make your print a little different density in Chicago, so you can see it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I I probably don't wear sunglasses as often in the in the Midwest as I do out here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a couple of questions for Matt regarding your platinum plating printing. Um, I had some internet trouble, so I had to jump back in and then you're right in the middle of your tour. So maybe you mentioned a little bit already, but um, for your transparencies, do you, what do you use? You use Pictorico or? Yeah, so um, we're printing through quad tone rip to Pictorico, okay. which is sort of the standard. And it's reasonably inexpensive. Um, once you get your calibration squared away, you're set. I've heard the quad core rip before, but I think I've heard it before, but can you explain a little bit more? Talking. So quad tone rip is a, a rip software that allows us to bypass what Epson thinks the printers should be doing. And it allows us to control things like individual ink values, gamma, et cetera, and so forth. Um, in a nutshell, I would say uh, it's a suffer fest uh, to learn. And then once, but once you get everything dialed in, Assuming that someone like Ilford doesn't change their paper chemistry or composition, which they do all the time, um, or if you know whoever's making your platinum and palladium solutions doesn't change their recipe, you can be reasonably consistent. In terms of chemicals, uh, what do you source right. them from? I'm getting chemicals from Bostic and Sullivan. There's only a couple of places you can get them. Yeah. Um, and Bostic and Sullivan does a great job. He's making them himself there. Um, really good stuff like i can order it and he'll say okay i'm gonna go buy more platinum today and then he shaves it down and sends it off to me so um i love that love that crew yeah and then when you're talking about the um bypassing like the it sounds more like kind of bypassing the profiles and so then are you making your own cur when you're when you talk about many different papers so then are you doing samples of each doing uh then doing curves of each one and improving them off each time. Yeah, you need to be calibrated for each different print process that you're doing each different paper ideally certainly if you're doing a pure platinum or a pure palladium or something in the middle it's good to be calibrated for each one of those um i know that the crew in vermont um john cone will calibrate for warm for cool for 10 different papers um so yeah it's it's it involves quite a lot there's also a great method um, that Bostic and Sullivan teaches, which does not use quad tone rip, but is a similar level of suffering in terms of diving through the Epson printer management software and forcing it to do what you want. Mm -hmm. um, but they're both painful. <laughs> <laughs> and then when, so when you're doing those curves, so that you're printing off like a, a swatch with you know, all the different shades, ingredients, and then are you measuring it using the machine or just kind of going up by, just by eye? Well, okay, so the smart way to do it is to um, read everything after off of your swatch and then have the machine generate you a, um, a curve that does the opposite. So the two things cancel each other out. Yeah. Um, but if you don't have a densitometer and you don't have a necessarily calibrated whatever, you can, you can suffer through it and guess and check. Um, that takes much longer. Yeah, It's much better to just <laughs> use your densitometer, get the readings, get the graph, um, and get the machine to do that. And that's getting easier and easier too. How many passes do you think it takes you to get it dialed? Just once or Two a couple? or three, assuming that you can keep your humidity and chemistry and paper and everything pretty consistent, you could do it um, in an afternoon, okay. certainly. And uh, then, sorry, go ahead. Matthew, uh, as far as your quad tone rip, you can go to Art Intersection and play around with it a little bit if you wanna, if you wanna see what it's like. Yeah, it's been a while, but I have to definitely, definitely want to go back and get into it. Um, and so I have done some platinum plenty in Matt or in intersection. And then I follow you, Matt, on Instagram. I saw you when you're building that 
UV box table, huge. It's awesome, by the way. Uh, jealous. And, uh, is that like, and then just because it's so big, what were some, I think, was it glass like the hardest part of it? Or uh, uh, if we lived in a properly that? large market, it wouldn't have been too bad. Uh, but Flagstaff's kind of a small town. So I actually had to have the glass made in California and brought out. And then I built my own. Um, you know, sort of exposure system out of just commercially available um, light fixtures. And then we spent a couple of months finding exactly the right UV light bulbs. That's really the trick right now. Was now it I know that you can, they make UV output LEDs, which a lot of people like, but these fluorescents put out a boatload of UV. So my exposures are less than two minutes most of the time, mm -hmm. um, which enables me to run through the process pretty quickly. Whereas yeah. an LED unit may take a little a little bit longer it was a special glass that you had a source or is it just because it's just size? a quarter inch tempered glass it's a four foot by ten foot sheet mm. so the, the only real problem was the size yeah and is that uh, a vacuum or are you just forcing pressure it's with just the, pressure uh, yeah. yeah clamps and then the weight of the lid on that thing is sufficient yeah <laughs> And then I guess my last question, um, for Platinum Palladium, what's your favorite paper to print on? I like the Arch Platine, spelled arches. Yeah. Um, it was specifically developed for Platinum and I find it the easiest to coat and the easiest to work with. Use a roller use, or a glass rod to coat or do you use a brush? I'm a brush guy. I'm super into the brush strokes and a lot of my clients like to see that brush stroke edge. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if I'm having a problem with the brush, I'll use a rod and then we'll just finish the, each stroke with a brush just to, to get the sort of vibe. Um, but because I'm making so many different sizes of prints all the time, having 75 different sizes of glass rods just sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so we try to avoid that. <laughs> Quite That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Mia, um, I have a question about the arches platine. Do you find mm -hmm. that the paper sinks to the bottom of the tray when you're soaking it? Yes. <laughs> and I like that. Okay, so you don't turn it over then, so it's not going to, okay. I do everything face up because, well, for one reason, Instagram. Everybody wants to see stuff. And a lot of the time, the photographer I'm working with is standing there next to me. Okay. And they want to see it and look at it and smell the chemistry and whatever else. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely a face-up chemistry kind of guy, um, at least with platinum. And I'm also a pretty aggressively agitating all the time. I don't let them sit for very long unless they're washing. Sure. Okay. Do you size the paper? I'm sorry. I do not. I don't do any paper sizing. We do a lot of humidity control, but I don't bother with sizing. Matt, I have another thing, different subject. You mentioned that film is in a surge right now. Many, many people are rediscovering or maybe discovering for the first time. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is it here to stay or? Oh man, big time. So we started processing color film a year ago just to see, well, mostly because I wanted to have my color film process and I didn't want to wait uh, to send it down to Phoenix. And we went from putting in a color line to 30 rolls a week in about six months. And that's just the local kids in Flagstaff, you know, the, the couple of people that are up here that are shooting that are just doing it for funsies. And so our whole staff are photographers we all have played with film cameras and we've kind of bought and sold them individually so we picked that up too but I know that Kodak has been throwing a bunch of money at new facilities um, Fuji keeps killing off films which I guess is their prerogative but they brought back Acros through Ilford because Ilford's doing the manufacturing for them so that's been really nice um, but yeah, I mean, between Cinestill and the other, and Kodak actually like taking a stance and saying, yes, we're going to keep doing film. It's been huge. You know, we're doing 1500 frames a week in scanning for film. 
Wow. You have an E6 processor, is that correct? Yeah, we're processing black and white color and E6. And we're running them through a series of um, Jobos. And the transparencies, uh, how are the people using the transparencies? What's their name? Scans. Are they them like the old days? <laughs> my... Oh man, not since they killed off Ilfrachrome, Cibachrome. Okay. Uh, it's, <laughs> although I have gotten several requests for proper slide projectors and carousels. Really? Um, most of the time, everything just gets scanned. Oh, okay. And, and the, what I've noticed is that a lot of the new film people, the people who are shooting film are really, um, I would say they're definitely on the very amateur side of things. So to get them to the point where they can meter well enough to shoot slide film is like a whole other thing. So by and large, it's color negative and black and white. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> cool. Let me, let me ask a question. Um, when you're scanning that kind of volume, what kind of scanners are you using? <laughs> Yeah, so um, we're using a copy stand system. Uh, we started with a flatbed scanner and that took me on average 20 minutes a roll, which obviously at 30 rolls a week is not something that can continue. So we're using hardware from negative supply, which produces the carriers and light sources. And then you can just use any digital camera and we can do about a roll a minute. Oh, wow. okay, wow. Nice. And then for the inversion, I'm using a program called Negative Lab Pro, which is a Lightroom plugin and does all of the film inversion and color correction for you. It's mostly automated. Hmm. Good, thank it you. Does a, it does an okay job. Okay, thank you. Yeah. A Matt, question, if you're, question oh. again for Matt. Yeah. Uh, if we wanted to stop by your studio, obviously you're talking to about 20 some people here right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we just let you know. And uh, I mean, how swapped do you get that you would not be able to take someone through and show them? We can almost always give you the, the you know, the dime store tour, you know, the, the yeah. 10 minute tour, which is basically what you just got, but it, we can answer your questions one-on-one -on -one and hang out and pull out some more prints and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, pretty much just stop by. If you can give me a heads up, you're coming, great. Yeah, because I think with AZPA, we'll probably get a few people here that'll be really interested in stopping by and actually visually seeing what you do. Yeah, once in a while, I mean, you know, maybe twice a quarter, I'll have someone flying in to do a week worth of work. And at that point, um, usually I have someone in the building that could give you the tour, but it won't be me. Because I'm going to be up to my eyeballs in, uh, you know, 15 new releases over the course of a week, um, which is a lot, how a lot of our clients will work with us. They'll come in and we just do the entire releases, you know, the entire stack of images over the course of the week. And then I can go sleep afterwards. Wow. <laughs> um, Matt, one question on your camera collection or your, uh, the ones you sell. Uh, do you take consignments from people? If I'm yeah. in the club, would yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Usually I'll prefer to just buy it outright. Um, it's easier for me to, to do that. Um, but if you want to set a price that's higher than what I think I can sell it for or what I'm willing to buy it from you for, um, we'll do consignments. We'll take 35%. Hmm. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. We'll all, we all come with uh, come up with suitcases of cameras to drop off. Oh, please do. <laughs> I tell you what, these NAU kids up here have been cleaning me out. Wow. So exactly. I need cameras in a big way. Good. Okay. <laughs> you got <laughs> Any other questions? Well. Well, a question uh, for Matt. Um, I guess for Richard, if I could ask one last uh, question, and that is, uh, when you're doing your visiting before you actually are starting to print, and you're scoping out where the exhibit area is going to be, do you have a uh, 
foot candle number that you're looking for that uh, if it's below that number, you know you have to make some changes or does it depend on what you're going to exhibit? And there's no way to actually have a, a threshold. No, a foot candle number is, is helpful because um, at some level, if, if your print is properly made under good lighting then and you have the right foot candle level, then it should look just fine. Yeah. Um, so um, roughly in the, in the range of 50 to 75 foot candles, that range, depending on the space, at the print, Mm -hmm. um, is a pretty good place to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if it's below fifty, uh, you would want to you would want to see that number higher. With move the light closer. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Or get a bigger bulb. Okay. Um, I, I find myself wanting to know how you, um, you and Matt sort of price things. How, how uh, you know, if I want to come up and work on a single print and, um, and, and kind of work through your process of creating a master print and a master file, um, I know it's probably hard to come up with a, um, a number, but what, what should I be comfortable spending in that situation? Uh, do you have any guidance for me there? Well, I can start. Um, uh, I charge a rate of $150 an hour, plus the cost of the material that we're printing on. Okay. And you'll walk away with a, a set of match prints. You might have three prints, you might have one, you might, you know, you might have one, you might, decide to look at it a little bit different way but we we um we focus, we can actually work on a number of images for that in that same time frame yeah so, uh, so you really won't have to be restricted to just one image okay okay um my pricing's a little different we uh price just based on the size of the finished print and we'll do as many proofs and as long as it takes to get us there Okay. Usually, it's pretty quick. Uh huh. Yeah. And do you do you typically print a whole edition? If if I have an edition of fifteen, do you do that at one time, or can you can easily and efficiently come back and make additional prints as you need to? Well, if you're asking me that question, no. it's going to be different than that. Depending yeah. on the process, it really depends on the process, because um, if it were if we're talking about inkjet. I wouldn't recommend printing an entire edition at once because then you've got to store them, you've got a potential for damage, you've got all kinds of shipping issues that might occur as a result of having all those printed at the same time. When in fact, yeah. with Inkjet, you can reproduce that image virtually the same every time you, you print it out. Yeah. So I would just do what you need and then fill in with any orders that you get. With, mm -hmm. uh, with Matt's processes though, I'll let him describe that. Yeah, my process is the opposite of that. Um, once we're going to set up the dark room and we have a negative printed and we know our exposures and today is the day that today is, which means we have today's humidity and everything else. Yeah. And we have the temperature at a certain or the chemistry at a certain temperature. We want to do them all now. Yeah. So uh, there's a, there's a, <laughs> it's much easier to get the entire thing done up front at once. They'll be much more consistent if I can do them over the course of two or three days than if you do one a year, you know? Yep, right. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. I have a question. Yep. I just was wondering, what is the uh, optimal process if you're concerned about the longevity of your print? In terms of like which prints last the longest or? Yes. Which, uh, what would you recommend if somebody wanted to make a print that was going to like last a long time? 
Well, in black and white, that's a reasonably simple answer. Um, platinum's going to last a really long time. But it's also really expensive. And it's almost impossible to do color in platinum in a way that you'll get it reproducible like you do in inkjets. So with um, silver gelatin, if it's properly printed, properly washed, it could also last a really long time, and they do. Um, Inkjet will last uh, probably a really long time if it's um, on good paper, uh, a good rag paper. Um, Cibachrome, which I was, which I printed a lot of for many years, um, is probably the most stable color process I've ever seen. Uh, but it doesn't, it isn't around anymore. <laughs> so it's no longer a choice. What are they saying on inkjets these days, Richard? What do we expect out of those? 200 years. Well, typically, you know, you, 100 years gets batted around pretty frequently, sometimes longer if it's dark storage. Again, if it's all on a 100% rag paper, of course. Um, but I kind of believe it would last a long time. You know, I don't have the, the experience of seeing anything fade yet because have inkjet hasn't been around that long and I don't expect to live that much longer in terms of <laughs> like longevity of prints. I would like to live a lot longer by the way, but <laughs> not, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be 50 or hundred years from now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that Jeremy Rowe is fond of saying that the, the most uh, vulnerable thing in a room full of People in photographs are the people. People, right. <laughs> I would get this question asked a lot when I was printing, making C prints and and in um, and, and the last few years, uh, probably the last 20, 15 to 20 years, C prints have gotten very stable. Um, and when I get the question, I would say, yeah, they're probably gonna be a lot, around a lot longer than you, so. Um, <laughs> Is there that, a that more, is there a more vulnerable uh, technology or uh, type of print? Uh, inkjet on an RC-based paper with, um, with optical brighteners are probably less stable than anything uh, in inkjet. Okay. Yeah, I've I seen was, was still numbers of, about... I'm you know, oh, sorry, Richard, go ahead. I would just steer clear of... Uh, papers, uh, RC papers with optical brighteners if you're printing inkjet. Yeah. I, uh, dye can sub I prints. Can I, can I interject with Matthew's question? There's a place out of San Francisco called the What Now Foundation. And they experiment with all photographic processes and they do experimental to determine the, how long that process will last. I do carbon printing. They figure a properly cared for a carbon print could last up to 500 years. Well, yeah, I've got, I've got two Adolf Brown carbon prints in my shop right now for framing and they are beautiful. They look like they were made yesterday and they're, you know, 160 years old. Oh, or something. Wow. That's yeah, really, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think Woodbury types are much more, you know, much more much more longevity than the albumin albumin prints that they were reproducing. And so a lot of that stuff is is you know the albumins don't look great, but the Woodbury types look beautiful. And you could think that's the way the albumin looked, you know, probably when it was made. So. Dennis, have you seen any carbon color prints? Uh, I've done color carbon. Have you? Oh, well, yeah. you're, you're my hero then. <laughs> and let me let me tell you, people that ask, I always tell them you got to be a little bit insane to try to do that process. Yeah, and you got to really. Uh, I'm I'm very right. impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Any other I questions? Can't wait to go find just, some prints just, to show a, us. just to show you, this is an inkjet print. <laughs> But I did a color carbon print of this. Oh yeah. And someone purchased the print out of Art Intersection. Nice. Great. 
Terrific. You could actually on the carbon, you could run your finger along the grill and you could feel the ribs of the grill because it was so yeah. three dimensional. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Good for you. <laughs> Is E6, I mean, E just uh, E6, is it a, uh, so many slides I've looked at over the, have shifted. Uh, is it still a problem? Well, how old are the slides you looked at that are shifting? Including Kodachrome? I don't know. They seem... Well, Kodachrome, I wouldn't expect to shift. Right, yes. But, um, you know, Ektachrome from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, certainly 50s and 60s, had a very unstable cyan dye layer. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they would turn red. Yeah. You know, if you get into the late 70s and 80s, and certainly in the, at least in the 80s, I think they got produced, the ectochrome got a lot more stable. E6 dyes got a lot more stable. Mm -hmm. I've seen too, a lot of the old E6 storage sleeves were, it took them a while to figure out exactly which compounds that they were going to use to make them. And mm -hmm. so you've, I've seen some even from the 80s and 90s that were not good sleeves and the film has suffered as a result. Mm. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Uh, I'll tell, uh, I'll send you, uh, Kevin, I'll send you a link to a lab in Spain that I think you need to look at, see what they're doing. Who's Kevin? I'm at, I'm, I'm drawing a blank again now. Matt. 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 <laughs> I, I'm confusing Matt and Matthew here. So okay. yeah, Matt, uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the treasurer, so I'm probably going to be sending you something here pretty soon. <laughs> I'll, send, I'll send you a link to a, 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 this person in. Oh boy. Spain. Uh, send, it, send it to me as well, if you don't mind, Dennis. Yeah, I'll, yeah. yeah. Send it to everybody. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, Richard, uh, let me ask you, uh, how did you get started doing this? Are you a photographer? Do you have a photo background or, or, or how did that begin for you? I, start, I started out as a photographer and was a photographer for a number of years. I was a photographer both uh, in a local studio, both doing some commercial photography and some portrait photography and wedding photography, you know, you had to kind of, you did everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always got drawn to the dark room and I had an opportunity to work in a commercial lab in, in the seventies. And then once I started in the professional lab setting, I just never looked back. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I've always considered myself a printer first and a photographer second, um, after being, after making the commitment to stay in the lab. So I, kind of understand some of the challenges photographers have, but I don't ever consider myself calling, my, calling myself anyway, a photographer, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. um, that's just a whole nother, whole nother level of, of, you know, image capture that I don't get involved in, but I do appreciate all the hard work photographers do to get the images they get and then I look at it from my standpoint of being, how can I help them translate that into a print that meets or exceeds their expectation? That's, yeah. And Matt, I know you are a photographer. Um, I've seen images with you making pictures and you, we saw some of your work earlier. Um, was that a kind of, are you, you're still working and, and making photographs and exhibiting them and everything? You find yeah, you have the time. I kind of figure that it's, you know, kind of like Richard's talking about, you know, knowing what photographers are going through and understanding, you know, the different film stocks and the different technology and everything that's out there. So I kind of consider it my job to, or part of my job to play with all of that and understand exactly what's happening in the market so that I can better understand 
what the files are doing and you know everything else so yeah i'm still shooting i'm i'm pretty much exclusively shooting film and for platinum printing but um you know i kind of play with a little bit of everything just so we can keep my keep my fingers on what's going on yeah yeah and do you shoot digitally as well or when i have to all right <laughs> i think film is, is is a fair bit more fun it's more my style it's a little slower um, I shot sports for six years. And so the run and gun digital big glass thing is not part of what I'm interested in anymore. <laughs> yeah. Go slow. yeah. 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 You know, I, I made a, I made an image on a digital and a film, you know, on, on, on film side by side, same scene in black and white way. This, the, if I just converted it to black and white, if I just took the file and con took out, you know, desaturated it, it looked nothing like the film, you know? And so if I'm shooting black and white, I'm gonna shoot film. I'm, if I'm shooting color, I'm gonna shoot digital. And I think that's the way I've kind of resolved yeah. it. But it was really yeah. striking how much, how, how ugly, the, <laughs> at least my way of converting, you know, which was, you know, really basic. And um, I'm sure that there is a way to do it better, but my way of converting the black, the color to black and white was made it look horrible you know, <laughs> by comparison yeah so another of the things i like about shooting film is by the time you've made given yourself a much bigger film sensor six 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 seven six nine four by five you can do that for so much less money than a medium format digital camera costs oh yeah yep. so and because a lot of what we do is is ridiculously large prints um you know we like to play with the big cameras and have nice big sensors yeah I, I get it. Yeah, I've, I've, <laughs> I've shot my fair share of four by five film, but I don't, you know, I, I don't know that I would pick up a film to shoot color. I think that the color is, you know, um, is superior in digital. Uh, it's easier to work with downstream too, I think, you know, making a print. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that I would, I, I would imagine that our membership is probably even if they're shooting film, they're often printing digitally, um, you know, and that was the yeah. sort of the hybrid I had. Yeah. Yeah. So if I brought in a four by five negative to be scanned, would you, would you photograph it or put it on a flatbed or put it on a drum scanner? I'm going to send it to someone to drum scan it. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. We don't do that here. Scanning is its own art form and I'm not diving down that rabbit hole right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I have some people that I work with that I that do an incredible job of drum scanning. And so that's what I recommend everyone do with big film. I see. Okay. Unless we're doing optical enlargements, in which case that's great too. Yeah. And so you're you're printing negatives on a Epson printer, right? I mean for mm -hmm. contact printing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Nice little hybrid of film and digital. Yeah. Well, that was a great story about Dan Budnick and the, you know, and, and technology being brought to bear on his pictures that he could not have dreamed would exist <laughs> when he made those right, images. Like he had the vision. He knew exactly what he wanted, but the technology just wasn't there until yeah. Photoshop's ability to do those photo merges really came into its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Anybody else have a question? Comment, announcement. I'm just, I'm just curious as to uh, what you see coming on down the road. You got any future predictions you can share with us? Jay, you're muted. That's why nobody can hear you, buddy. Sorry. Um, future predictions. Are you talking about the industry as a whole? You're talking about Printing, film. What are you? What are you talking about? Um, I could industry as a whole. Maybe, maybe just specifically about printing. I don't know if I have an answer to that. Well, I mean, you know, they, I'm focused on the old school stuff. So <laughs> Richard's much more in, with immersed in to, the new uh, stuff. To you know, inkjet technology. Um, that's going to continue to develop for a couple of reasons. One is they, they can sometimes come up with a superior product, but you know, 
companies are driven to come out with new product, whether they need to or not, just to, you know, have something to sell. And sometimes it's a good idea and sometimes it's not. But overall, long term, I think we'll continue to get better on the digital print side. It's actually pretty good right now compared to what it was, you know, 15 or 20 years ago when nobody wanted to look at an inkjet print. Um, I can remember the days when digital first started becoming talked about, not really in the mainstream, but a digital camera would come out and it was always compared to a film camera. Well, it's not as good as film. Yeah, but it's always the yeah, but it's not as good as film until about the late 90s. Then it started getting a lot better. Actually, it was more like uh, mid 2000s to the like 2008, 2009 when Nikon first came out with a really good chip. Um, I started doing things with digital I couldn't do with film and that really got my attention. And um, so um, I think Dre's trying to get on. Jay, are you trying to t say something? There's a lower left of your lower left part of your screen, lower left part of your screen. There's a little mute button on your on your mic, but it says mute. Can you okay. unmute? Left. Trying to unmute. There you go. There you go. Now you're good. All right. I've got I've got an adventure story. Okay. It has to. Be. And a phone. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, the, uh, the, I was able to produce this, you know, exhibits today um, in the last few years that I couldn't have dreamed of doing inkjet just a few years ago before that. So it is getting better. Richard Jackson and I have a long history together and it's been very good. Uh, it all started in 1996, a good, are you, is my voice coming through finally? Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, Any, in 1996, a good friend of mine, a rancher and a, uh, a mountain lion hunter, he was on a hunt in, in uh, Southern Arizona and he ended up. It's Frank, I get him. Get rid of it. Anyway, he's, he ended up taking the first photographs of the. God damn this! Turn it off. He's on the computer, and you're really screwing things. Okay. Stop calling. Anyway, he, he had a little bitty camera in his saddlebag. And he, no. he, he got some color negative shots of a wild jaguar in New Mexico. And um, these t the, the jaguar had taken ref refuge in a uh, bright area with deep shadows. And these, these negative negatives were were terrible, and the prints that came back from the lab were terrible. And I knew that we wanted to to reproduce these images in a book that I was helping with. So I knew that I had to send these negatives to Richard, and he was able to get pretty much vis visibility throughout these horrible uh, uh, color negatives. So, so and it, this got published in a, in a book with a reason, reason, reasonably readable images. And, but I had to go to, I knew to go to Richard so he could make some prints that would uh, reproduce uh, reasonably well. But Richard and I have worked together on other 
on other matters, and I ended up uh, um, uh, Richard was involved in uh, making a print on a big Epson printer that ended up with a five foot high by six and a half foot wide image that is in the permanent collection of the uh, Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, and I, it's something I'm real proud of. But, and then Richard wanted, had a client that wanted a big silver print from a four by 10 negative of mine. And I went to Hidden, hidden Light. I worked in uh, with the dark room guy and uh, they ended up making a 20 by 50 inch silver print from a uh, four by 10 negative. And I felt very sorry for the poor guy that had to spot the print. <laughs> and, um, archival processing in my own personal darkroom, that, which I abandoned over 10 years ago, in spotting and all the crap that you had to go through to pr produce a silver print, I just couldn't handle it anymore. But uh, and I've had other other uh, work done by by uh, uh, hidden light. I I my photographic archive is is in the uh, Booth Western Art Museum in Georgia, and. Uh, a lot of the work that was framed and, and went into the retrospective exhibition, uh, some of those were big uh, inkjet prints by a wonderful collaborator that I worked with for years and years, Car Carlos Mandela Vietia. And, uh, but I had, I discovered that I had some uh, silver prints that hadn't had never been properly uh, archivally processed, and I brought uh, a number of prints to Hidden Light, and I said, "Here, I'll pay. We'll pay you guys to do the archival processing, and and, and you mount them, and and I can." It's my imagery, and I can legitimately sign it. So we worked together on that on that process, and some of those some of those silver prints that went through the went through the mill at uh, Hidden Light or are in the uh, Booth Museum as part of my archive. Uh, I don't know. I'm. Maybe I'm taking too much time, but but I sure have had a wonderful relationship with Richard Jackson and with the two troops at Hidden Light. And maybe we'll work together again sometime. But I, I wanted to mention that I've had a wonderful, rela wonderful relationship with uh, Carlos and back in uh, probably 15 years or so ago, we pioneered the making of really big uh, inkjet prints. And that was the possible bill because I had done a lot of uh, photography with the eight by 10. I, I had a Guggenheim Fellowship to travel the whole western part of North America from Western Canada down into uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. And I shot four by 10 portraits of the working cowboys there. And when Carlos could scan and, and work with an eight by 10 negative and then make some 
four foot by five foot or, or bigger prints, I felt that, uh, that we were kind of on the leading edge of making big prints, serious prints. So uh, uh, I don't know what, what else to impart to you, you guys at this time. I'm real glad that I, I got off, I got unmuted and <laughs> it's like we are becoming unneutered. <laughs> and it's a great feeling, believe me. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of your hair, but thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, that I I have seen the prints that you made with uh, Carlos, and they are as good as anything I've ever seen. Uh, I, I just love those prints. Uh, the big eight by ten negatives scanned and and printed large. Yeah. Well, thank um, you for that yeah. Comment. Yeah. Um, this has been a wonderful guy for me to work with over the years. Yeah. Um, I have one other question for Richard. Um, the the thing that you know the kind of Achilles heel in the inkjet print on matte paper for me is the fragility of the objects. Um, and I, I, mean, I shouldn't really complain because people bring them to me to be framed because they are so. Uh, they are so fragile, <laughs> so it's a it's good for my business. But I I wonder if you have any thoughts on will the technology get better? Will the prints be less vulnerable in the future? Um, is spraying them some kind of option that would increase or would decrease the chance of them getting um, you know marred or scuffed? Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, matte prints are. Um... Are, are difficult to handle, as you know. It only takes you looking at them just slightly the wrong way and there's a little scuff across the deep black somewhere. Yeah. Um, I don't know of any, any products coming out that would, would improve that. There might be some sprays that would be useful, but I've never, I've never used any sprays on any prints. Yeah. Just a whole nother thing you have to set up for and do it properly, or you might as well not do it. And I, and I frankly don't print very many matte prints. I usually print on uh, paper like Hanson Platine, which requires a photo black ink, and it's much more um, friendly to handling than a matte print is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't have any good answers for you, Richard, except be careful and then frame them. So you can't <laughs> okay. to touch them anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Are there other questions for anybody? All, all I can say is just let's visit uh, Flagstaff and uh, see this, you know, this place in person. I think it's a good idea for the group to do I'd that. Be, I'd be glad to go. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's charter a bus and go up there. <laughs> <laughs> or we could just get in the back of your truck. And... Yeah. Yeah. And if Alan's going up that way, we could all just ride with him. <laughs> <laughs> I come all in. <laughs> It'll be good. Okay, let's, well, uh, you guys all come up on a bus, and we'll go do a photo walk, and we'll do a tour, and yeah, end up great. at a restaurant somewhere. That'll be perfect. Yeah. yeah. That sounds great. Well, thank you guys so much for, for doing this. It's, uh, it's really been a pleasure getting to know you and, and listening to what you uh, do. You clearly are driven to, you know, very conscientious in your work and driven to produce the kind of results that your clients demand. And, and it's just it's been a pleasure to talk to some craftsmen, you know, and I look forward to the time when we can all get together and, 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 and look at that light reflected off the uh, light sensitive metals or the ink uh, and the paper. Um, uh, that's just been a really hard part of this for me is to, is to know the kind of effort that goes into objects and that we can't see them right now. <laughs> it just drives me crazy. So anyway, thank you very much and thanks everybody for coming. My pleasure, thank you yeah. for having us. Okay. Yeah. Thank Come you. on up to Flag at any time. You bet. Do. <laughs> thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>